will call the April 9th meeting of the Traffic and Park Parking Advisory Board meeting to order. Good afternoon and welcome. The Traffic and Parking Advisory Board reviews items of interest regarding parking and traffic items. We are an advisory board and our favorable recommendation today will go before the Oshkosh Common Council. The Council can either accept or reject any recommendation from this board. If you don't agree with our decision, you can discuss the item with any Council member. If the board does not recommend an item, a common council member may in fact sponsor a new ordinance regarding that same item. All items require two readings before the common council. The first reading will take place on Tuesday, April 23rd at 6 p.m. and you will be allowed to comment on the item at that time though the council will take no action. On Tuesday, May 14th at 6 p.m., the item will be on a second reading at which time the council will take action. You will be again afforded the opportunity to speak at that time. For this afternoon's meeting, I will read each agenda item, at which time, if you'd like to speak, please step to the podium and give your name and address. I do ask that you keep your comments pertinent to that specific agenda item. The item will then come back to this board for discussion and ultimately action. Please call the roll. Here. Staple? Here. Wanschneider? Here. Becker? Here. Christensen? Here. Oz? Here. Herman? Here. First item on this afternoon's agenda is approval of prior minutes. So moved. Second. Questions, comments, concerns, additions, or deletions? At least publicly, I'd like to thank Mr. Haas for uh, pinch hitting in my absence last month. Seeing nothing else, please call the roll on approval of prior minutes. Szynski? Aye. Staple? Aye. Wanschneider? Aye. Becker? Aye. Christensen? Aye. Oz? Aye. Herman? Aye. Aye. Second item then is public comment. This board has adopted a public participation policy which provides 15 minutes for general public comment on a first come first serve basis. Citizens must provide both name and address and may speak on matters related to traffic issues within the authority of this board. Statements should be addressed to the board members and not to staff or other persons. Items that are on, the, are on the agenda should be addressed at the time the item is read and not during this period for public comment. Statements are limited to three minutes and citizens may only provide comment one time unless special permission is granted. Is there anyone that wishes to avail themselves of the opportunity? No, I'm, I'm okay. Yep. You state your name and address for the record. Mike Highmark, 2340 Abbey Avenue. Um, I've been wanting to do this for about 10 years now. Um, I live. Welcome. Can we, can we, can we <laughs> thanks, Dan. Can we pull up on the screen? Sure. The address um, in question. Jim, can you pull up the corner of Abbey and Graceland? Sure. Greenfield. 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 Sorry. Should have had you do it while you were up yeah. there before. So, pardon? H E I M A R K. Mm -hmm. So, just a little backstory. About 10 years ago, I had talked to Paul Esslinger based on where my house sits on the corner. Um, I'm at 2340. So, if you scroll a little bit to the right, right? Okay, so where that fence is, I'm the next house back. So, as you can tell from my front window, if you go up the street right to about there, and then my bay window is right on the left there. So, sitting every night, I can watch cars go through this intersection constantly. Um, there are two yield signs one coming east and one coming west on Abbey, as you can see them kind of right there on the corner. Um, so about 10 years ago, they did a traffic study, put the, the counters down there. There wasn't enough traffic to turn those into stop signs. Uh, there's been numerous accidents. In fact, what brought me here today was yesterday morning. Um, I was sitting in the living room, saw a white car go flying by. I'm like, there's no way he's gonna stop, bang. Um, and it was a guy that lives up the street that ended up hitting this guy. It's inevitable it's going to happen. I know there was a, a bad one last year. There's been a couple bad ones, cars on their sides. I know there's probably not enough traffic there to warrant a stop sign, but I don't know what it's going to take somebody getting killed, hurt really bad to stop this. I mean, traffic moves at a 
I know it's 25 miles an hour. I can guarantee you that less than half are doing 25, both on Greenfield and on Abbey, and they'll blow right through that. I've got an 18-year-old. He laughs at me every time I said, you just turned here and didn't even look because it's going to happen to him too. I showed him the pictures from yesterday. So um, the accident yesterday, I mean, basically he ended up hitting that telephone pole there and barely missed by about six inches the fire hydrant. So one of these days I'm sure something's going to happen a little bit more serious just based on the speed. Um, I'd like somebody to just at least take a look at putting two stop signs there instead of two yield signs hmm. before something happens. Yeah, that's something that's something we can take a look at. You know, I'll, I'll have to look at the crash history and sure. all that. Stuff. And I'm going to tell you, I mean, if you're heading right now down Abbey this way, the way that house sits on the corner on the right and the way the car sits or the house sits on the corner on the left, you cannot see anything on Greenfield unless you are literally right there. I mean, if you back up a little bit, it's hard to see. you know, the house is right there. You can't see anything. So if somebody's coming down Greenfield right now and you're going and you're going to blow through that yield sign, <coughs> it's too late. I mean, and I know there's only so much you guys can do, on, you know, from a patrol standpoint, but I see it every day, just basically right out my my front window. I've always wanted to put even just a camera there and just a time lapse thing and just see how many times it happens <clears throat> during the day. Because I'm sure I'm not there 24/7, so I'm sure it happens more than that. But so there's a four-way yield intersection. There is a so, two-way yield. It's only two on Abbey. Okay. On the left and the right. Yeah, I mean, I can take a look at it. Generally, the warrants for stop sign there, like you said, it's it's traffic volume, it's, it's, um, not so much speed, but then uh, at crash history, and then if there's visual impairments. And know. I, the visual impairment piece for me, I think, is the biggest one. And you, I mean, if you are standing in my driveway, you can actually you can't see unless you're really right there on top of that yield sign. We we don't have a school fairly close to that where there would be a lot of pedestrian driving. No, there is pedestrian traffic. If you take that street all the way to the end, Abbey Park is down there. So okay. there are a lot of families that walk that from the, I forget what the duplexes and stuff are down okay. on Abbey on the other end, yep. but they'll walk down to the park. We get a lot of foot traffic, so. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I'll definitely, I'll take a look at it and then I'll let you know when, sure. we, when we're gonna sure. take it up. Yep. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else that wishes to avail themselves of public comment? I already knew the answer because there's no one else here. But uh, <laughs> which brings us to new business. First item, a request for no parking in the 300 West parking lot stalls 37 through 39 until 9 a.m. Monday through Friday. Current condition being two hour parking Monday through Friday. Um, so this is a request from the sanitation department. And then, um, so th this is behind Manila restaurant. There's these dumpsters here. So the, the sanitation department has been kind of on Manila to get this cleaned up because it was overflowing with trash this winter. Um, and they kind of manage these dumpsters. Um, so he's been out there to meet with them a couple times and they talked to their waste disposal contractor and he said the issue is when the truck gets there, if there's cars parked in these last couple stalls, they can't get in there. So on occasion they'll pass it up and then it just sits there till the following week. Um, so our sanitation supervisor talked to uh, their manager at Manila and what they are recommending is if we could just clear these couple stalls until 9 a.m. They said that would give them enough time to get in there. They could back in, do what they need to do, and get out of there, you know, in a clear shot pretty easily. And I've looked, I've looked out there a few days, you know, the last few weeks, and I mean, there's plenty of open stalls in the area before 9 a.m. So I think uh, it, it would make sense. Just and like I said, they're only really talking about a couple hours to just clear it so they can get their trucks in and out of there. Uh, second. Yeah. Second. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Collins? 
I do. Um, what's changed over the years? That this has always or all of a sudden become a problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's changed in that parking lot? Yeah, that I don't know if, if people have decided they want to park here. I, I know this winter, you know, with all the snow we had, I guess that's the main change. The this, this, this snow was built up, which was, um, you know, they had some of it was kind of piled in this area and they were having more of a hard time getting at it. Um, but I, we're going to talk a little bit more with uh, not specifically about this, but about the dumpster enclosures downtown in general with the bid board at an upcoming meeting. But um, this is kind of Manila's kind of manages these dumpsters, but they're not necessarily theirs. They're part of the parking lot. So they kind of, however, whatever agreement they have with the business owners to share the costs, but they're the ones that deal with the contractor. And the contractor is basically saying that lately, and I don't know if it must be a new thing, but this winter, the problem they were having was between the snow and the cars parked here. They just couldn't get at it. So part of it may also be that the overnight parking hasn't really been enforced very stringently, okay. which, which is where I was going to go next, um, Jim. Um, I get the snow. That makes perfect sense. I mean, mm -hmm. we all deal with it. We may have to deal with it the next day or two again. But um, how are we going to enforce this? I mean, if somebody's getting to work at uh, 730 and that's their favorite spot, it's the one closest to whatever door they need to mm -hmm. go in, chances are they're going to park there. Yep. So how are we going to enforce it and how are we going to sign it? Well, yeah, we'll, I'll, we'll, we'll sign it, no parking, you know, and, and put the hours on there. But No parking midnight to 9 a.m.? Or whatever. There, yeah. Probably 2. Is there's already, in the morning? there's no parking from 2 to 5 a.m. So what we'd probably just put the no parking from 2 to 9 a.m. And then as far as enforcement, we can ask Captain Harris. I, I, I assume that would be on a complaint basis. Um, we do have the two to five parkers that do it. I know are fully staffed as of right now. So that being that that's in downtown Central City, I'm really certain. Um, with that being said, that's just a ticket. That's not a tow away or anything like that. So if there is a car there, it would still be there in the morning. <coughs> that was halfway to solving the problem. And only the one day a week too, right? Yeah, I imagine though, if you get one ticket, you're. <laughs> I'm not do it again. Uh, I, I, he might <laughs> beg to differ with you. I know there are several of them, many, but, <laughs> but yeah, they would enforce. I mean, if there was a car that was there for multiple days and they abandoned the vehicle process when we started, but that's going to take several days to remove that vehicle. Sure. <clears throat> what else? All right, seeing none, call the roll on agenda one. Szynski? Aye. Staple? Aye. Schneider? Aye. Becker? Aye. Christensen? Aye. Oz? Aye. Herman? Aye. Carrie? 7-0. Agenda 2 is a presentation on the community maps crash application by Rick Oleg of Oleg Consulting. I hope I didn't butcher your name. Law enforcement liaison and consultant for WISDOT. <coughs> Did everyone get the... Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, so I invited... Um, Rick does this for, for, for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, and then he also works with local law enforcement um, agencies. Um, so as you know, like last meeting, we had a presentation by East Central. Um, this is also similar type data, but they have a different application to help identify crash trends. Um, it's something that he worked with the state to develop. And all the data comes from the Wisconsin Traffic Operations and Safety Laboratory, which kind of compi compiles data from local law enforcement crash reports. Um, and as you know, each year we kind of com compile the city annual crash report. And what's been happening is I'm kind of trying to recreate some things. Now that they've created some of these mapping um, tools, it's going to be a lot easier. So I'm looking, I'm probably going to start using some of these a little more heavily. But uh, I thought you'd be interested in kind of seeing what's out there um, and a little bit of information on it, and obviously for um, the police department would be interested in this as well. So ask him to come and kind of show you what's out there. Okay, thank you. A um, little bit on my background. I worked for Fond du Lac Sheriff's Office for 35 and a half years, retiring two years ago, and now I'm a law enforcement liaison for the State Patrol's Bureau of Transportation Safety. Um, the website we're showing you is just that. It's a website. It's not a, a software that you have to buy. You can go on and Google uh, Community Maps Wisconsin, and this will be one of the first things that will come up. <clears throat> Under the About, I just want to show you where we're getting our data. 
Uh, from 2001 to 2009, it's manually mapped, meaning back then, uh, fatal crashes and A injury, which are the serious injury crashes, were put in manually by the counties or by the state. Uh, 2010 to 16, uh, when the crash report was submitted, and, and for most of them it was either a paper or electronic form, um, there was a computer guru that figured out how to say it's at Maine and you know Scott Street, and it, it knew where it was and it would map it. And then starting in 2017 with the new DT4000 crash report, uh, when the officers are doing the crash report, they actually drop what we call a pin on a map, and it puts the GPS location in there. The beauty of this is if you submit a crash report to the state today, it'll be on the map tomorrow. In the past, it used to take us, what, two years yeah. to be able to get the data? Uh, or you'd get a report every year, and it would, it would always be behind. So we would get reports now for 2016, maybe 2017. Um, this is something that you can actually do from your own home. Uh, the first part is a search. It's a uh, public side search, and it's fairly easy to do. First of all, you can't break the system because you're not touching any live data. But if we just go in there, and, and in the public side, you can only go by county. Um, so if we go in here and put Winnebago County and say, I want to know how many crashes have happened in Winnebago County this year. It maps all of the crashes. This shows you, there's a legend on the top here. Uh, red is fatal crashes. So we've had a fatal crash here and down, on, uh, down in this area. So we've had a couple of fatalities already this year. Um, serious injury crashes, injury crashes, minor injuries, and property damage. So you have the ability to take a look at where the crashes are. And you can go back all the way to 2001, so you could start looking at history if you wanted to look at something. And what I mentioned to Jim before this, I said it would have been interesting to take a look at 9th Street with the, what is it, five roundabouts. Mm -hmm. Look at two years before the construction, and then look at the area now and look at the, the reduction in crashes. And that's what we are hopefully using this for in most areas. But you also have the ability to go in here and say, of, of all these crashes, how many were alcohol? or drug related, and if so, where are they? So you can take a look at where your crashes are that are involving alcohol or drugs. Uh, we can look at speed related flags, and these are things that officers put in the crash report when they uh, complete the form. So again, you can see where your major speeding issues are. Crashes where somebody is not wearing a seat belt Again, you can narrow that down because you can zoom right in and see where those crashes are happening. And then one that was recently added is teen drivers. Now this doesn't mean that the teen driver was at fault, it just means there was a teen driver involved in the crash. So they may have been the driver of one of the two vehicles, it doesn't mean they were at fault. But again, you can start taking a look at it and usually you'll see they're around a school. Um, some of this here you can already see this is probably inexperienced drivers when you take a look where the crashes are happening so it lets us flag by any of that and take a look at you know where should our enforcement efforts be when we go to the advanced tab this requires a login which is normally law enforcement public works uh, highway departments traffic safety commissions now we have the ability to go a little bit deeper Now, this will be City of Oshkosh, but keep in mind, that does not mean that Oshkosh PD took the report. So if the Sheriff's Office took a report in the City of Oshkosh, it'll be mapped here, or the State Patrol, if they took one on, say on 41 that's in the city, it'll be in here. So we can again take a look at all of our crashes in the City of Oshkosh this year so far. And you can see there was one fatality the difference here is when we, when we find the dot and we click on it, we can see that it was a rear end crash handled by the Oshkosh Police Department on South Washburn at five o'clock at night on February 5th with one person being killed. In addition, and again, you have to have a login for this, but they can click on this and it actually brings up the physical crash report that was submitted by law enforcement. 
So now when you're having a discussion about it, it's a PDF file. So when it loads, you can see the detailed information, <clears throat> but it also gives you the diagram that was done by the, uh, the officer who was at the scene detailing what happened in the crash, as well as their diagram and, and their description. I won't go any further down with it because being at a public meeting, um, it'll have the driver's name, birth dates, driver's license numbers, and everything else, but it's the, the physical report that law enforcement submits. So for law enforcement, this is really beneficial, and for the engineers and, and uh, public works, because now they can look in here and see what the factors were that in, were involved in that crash. Um, so we can narrow this down and take a look at where your pedestrian crashes are. And when you start to see a pattern, if this continues, maybe something should be looked into. Maybe not this specific one, but when you start to see a bunch of them, that's where it'll flag it to, to Jim or Eddie to say, I need to take a look at this. Um, and it has areas where he can download to a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet and things like that. Now, one of the areas that, that you were talking about, and I don't know where that intersection is, um, that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, Abbey Avenue in Greenfield, yeah. Okay, whereabouts is that on this map? Uh, Off 9th, west of 41. Uh, Keep going left. Okay. A little further north. A little more. There's Abbey F and there's right here. Yep. Okay. What's nice with that is we can take this box right here and say I want to find all records within the box. And we can create a box at an intersection or anywhere we want. And then I can look at the timeline here and say, okay, we want to go back to 2016. You can choose whatever, you know whatever amount you want, and I can see if there have been any crashes in this area. And this shows since 16 there have not been any reportable crashes that are mapped in this area. Now, the one from yesterday obviously still wouldn't be in because mm -hmm. it usually takes up to a week. Uh, but it tells us that there are, are none that are mapped in this area, which basically tells me for sure there have been none since 2017 when the, the new crash report was made. Uh, there may be some before that, but we can open it up and go back to 2010, realizing that if they aren't mapped, they're not going to show up here. Okay, this shows one that happened September 14th of 2015. And here's the, this is an old form, old crash form. Uh, the, the old ones with the dots are actually in here yet from that far, that, that long ago. Um, so you can, you can take a look at this and look a little bit at what happened with the crash. Um, and it looks like just whoever, did, whoever did the diagram, they're spot on. <laughs> um, so can you see where this can really help public works and engineering? Um, it helps you make an informed decision. Um, and then one other thing that I will show you, I, would, I don't want to take all of your day, but one of the things he was talking about is how do I know where my bad intersections are? Now, we use it more for a law enforcement side to know where the intersections are that are bad. Um, but you can do an analysis can see it's not done here mm -hmm. computing analysis area this takes three years worth of data fatal serious injury and injury crashes and 
does an analysis for us and tells us where we should be concerned. These are the five areas that it came up with where your high uh, crash rates are. And then from there he can drill down into them and see exactly where they're happening. The, the, more, the, the larger the circle, the more crashes there are. You have the ability now to also look at this and say, I'm really only concerned with pedestrian crashes, because maybe you have somebody doing a, a, a project on pedestrians. So you can do the same thing looking at pedestrians. It's something we're currently doing in Kenosha. Six of the last 15 fa uh, fatal crashes down there were pedestrians. So again, you can kind of see where the, the areas of concern are for pedestrians and where they're involved in crashes. Doesn't mean the pedestrian's at fault, doesn't mean the driver of the car is at fault. It just tells us that pedestrians were involved in a crash. Um, so there's quite a bit that can be done with this. It's all, the data's already there. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a way to bring it all together so you can make an informed decision. And our goal is that rather than uh, most uh, state engineers and even probably the city looks at three to five years, some are looking at five to 10 years before they make any changes because infrastructure issues are expensive. They look at three to five years with the crash data. This, we're hoping that they will look at back like the last six <coughs> months and see if there's anything that has come up in the last six months that might either need to come here for some signage changes or may need something as simple as, you know, stop sign versus yield sign or um, if some construction is being done, maybe that now move the, as we were talking earlier, you know, did you just reconstruct this in intersection? Now, did that just move your crash problem somewhere else? And th this will kind of tell us when that happens. Because uh, even though I was in law enforcement for over 35 years, I always thought I knew where the crashes were. <laughs> but you really only know the ones that are in your neighborhood, the ones that are on the news, or in my case, the ones that happened when I was working or I heard about. Um, so this is just a tool that the state provides. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a, I, I see a couple of uses for it. I mean, first of all, you know, like you said, prior to 2007, well, I, I get this data, but I had to download it all in a spreadsheet and then try to determine where it was. I, we didn't have it mapped. Mm -hmm. So this is easier where I can just look at a map and see where the hotspots are or like if somebody calls and, you know, or wants me to look at an intersection like um, tonight, it, it just gives me somewhere easily to go and do a quick analysis and see what's there versus trying to download a bunch of crash reports. And then I, act, I have to log into the system, pull up the crash report, then I have to read it all and trying to manually look at the whole report with all the flags to determine what happened. This is a much quicker view, quicker way to get a high level view. But then I also think um, for the police department, this is something nice where they can, you know, if you guys want to target some type of you know, um, traffic safety initiatives, at least it, g it gives them an idea where they, they should focus. Um, and the one here will allow us to say, okay, over the next 30 days, on a weekday, during the day, where can I expect to <clears throat> see crashes? And it already gives you your high areas where you can expect to see daytime crashes in the next 30 days. I think one area too would be where we did the road diets mm -hmm. on Murdoch and Nine. Look at before yep. and after. Before oh, and definitely. afters. Yep. And obviously the Jackson Street corridor. Right. We're still getting a lot of complaints mm -hmm. down in that area. The nice but, thing is the data is at your fingertips. Right. Right. And you don't have to. It used to be phone calls to Madison to get this information. Now it's all right there. Right. So. And like for law enforcement, if you want some of your supervisors trained in how to use this, let us know. We'll have somebody stop up and do the training. It takes about 45 minutes, and it's free. Ooh, free is good. Free is good, yes, sir. <laughs> Any questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Big tool. Which brings us to staff statements. Um, just a couple. The. Uh, Jackson Street, or excuse me, Oregon Street, the construction started. Um, that's being reconstructed from West 16th Avenue to West 21st Avenue. Um, so that project has started. Hazel Street, 
um, is being reconstructed from Washington to East Irving Avenue, and that's supposed to start in about a month and a half or two. Um, and then just a couple other quick updates. The um, we've got a couple. We've received some questions about it, but uh, the state is doing some work on the Congress Avenue Ashkosh Avenue bridge um, that will be starting at the end of this year. They're going to start like December, January, but that bridge is going to be down while well, it's going to be out of commission for vehicle traffic for about six months. They are going to have it open for navigational season, so it'll probably be in the upright position for a few months once we get to the spring. I know some people were concerned, boarders were concerned they weren't going to be able to get through, but they will be. And it's not a reconstruction, they're just doing maintenance on the mechanical parts of the bridge. Um, and then there's some other, you know, we got to update some electrical infrastructure and things like that, but it's it's still going to be the same lift bridge, it's just more maintenance. <clears throat> um, so if anybody's curious about that. Um, and then, um, like Steve mentioned, that we're still at Jackson Street. We're working on putting together the proposal for um, a consultant to do a corridor plan, and along with that will be a, a safety, um, a, a corridor plan, and they'll also be doing a safety and traffic analysis um, of the area from the safety aspect and traffic will probably be from Church to Murdoch, and then the planning department's looking for more of a land use type corridor plan from, from Jackson North to Highway 41. So we've been, we got a couple drafts of that out, should be done in the next few weeks, and then we'll have to get it out to for request for proposals and then uh, select a vendor. And then after they get into the process, then um, we'll have some public input meetings. And then um, at the end of it, obviously, they'll do probably a workshop with the Traffic Review Board, Plan Commission, Bike and Pad Council. Um, but that'll take some time, but that is in the works. Um, so that we're working on that. And then uh, next month, you know, we will have a meeting. I already got um, a decent agenda for next month, so you can plan on a meeting next month. Um, I had a couple of citizens contact me. The road shift at Oshkosh Ave in Westfield, that's a temporary until we reconstruct that intersection in at Oshkosh Ave, correct? It veers, when you get past the intersection, it kind of veers to the south. Have we had any issues there at all? Any accidents? No, the, the, the only thing there is the, um, so on Oshkosh Avenue, some of the street paints wore off. Mm -hmm. So we need to get out there and update the, the street painting. It's not, the only traffic changes there are we currently have um, temporary signals up at that intersection. We're gonna be putting monotube, so the big heavy duty deal with the, with the left turn arrow, with the flash okay. and yellow. Um, so anyway, those are, on back order, but then the factory in Nebraska got flooded, so they're actually even further behind now. <laughs> um, so okay. we just have temporary controls there for now. But the only other change in that area that I'm aware of is they're going to be putting a right turn bypass lane in at, right. at the roundabout. Um, when you're so basically when you're going um, west on Ashkosh Avenue, um, out of basically out of the the road mm -hmm. coming out of Ashkosh mm -hmm. Corp, going to add another right lane there so you can get on 41 northbound easier mm -hmm. um but you're talking about on oshkosh avenue well you know when they redid that right by robbins there the old robbins restaurant they they did a lane shift the road got with construction and new construction right you kind of have to do a, kind of a i don't want to say a lane deviation because you can stay in your lane but you're shifting to the south a little bit once you're past the intersection and don't know if that's created a problem and you know it's, some citizens were concerned that they got cut off because cars realized they need to be in the left lane and they, they thought they were going straight so and the um going west okay going west that the road changes that the issue with the paint setting anyway of talking about that i think that's the issue then. it could yeah. be that too sure i sure. think it, I th it's correct that there's paint yeah i think yeah that could be because i know that uh, and one other because it's getting busier and busier all the time is Witzel and West Haven. Has there been any discussion to put a left turn signal in there at all? Because traffic can go straight in both right. lanes, yep. but a lot of cars I, I've noticed in the last, and I'll be driving it quite a bit now because golf season's yep. around and I come from the north side. A lot of cars, you know, you, sometimes you got 10, 10 cars wanting to turn south right. or the other way, going, yep. going down West Haven to the hospitals. I'm wondering if maybe a, you know, 20, what, what, how long are they when you do a designated turn uh, arrow? 
30 you, seconds. Oh, you mean how long? Yeah. Yeah. Roughly. It varies a little bit, but. Um, I mean, I'm not saying we need a designated lane. I'm right. just saying maybe a designated turn arrow for a short period of time to create that intersection out. Yeah, it's something we've looked at in the past. The issue in the past was we didn't have the pedestrian infrastructure, but we actually have the push buttons there now. Mm -hmm. Because in the past, we didn't have any way for um, a pedestrian to get across because we didn't have the buttons there. Okay. Um, but now that we have the buttons there, it's something we could look at. That's actually, it's county highway, so oh. I have to work with the county to see okay. if that's something they're interested in. But it, I know we've... I've had that request a number of times, and I actually I just talked to our electrical supervisor about that about a month ago. And now that we have the push buttons, it's possible. We just have to analyze if it makes sense or not. Yeah, yeah and, and I, I guess well, we get the easy data. <laughs> I don't know that we've had a lot of accidents there. Right. But that's kind of, if you want to say, that's got a little bit of Jackson New York flavor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I sure don't want to have a you know no turn left, left turn during certain times. Right. But I, I do think during busy times of the day, maybe morning and when most businesses get out around three o'clock, mm -hmm. might be a, something to look at. Yeah, it's that same issue with, uh, with the left turns, not being able to see the curb lane. Offset, yeah. yeah. Because it's, you, you have the two left turning vehicles and they right. can't see in this curb lane. So right. it, it hasn't come up as a higher crash location in the last time I did the report, okay. but I know that during peak hours, there is a lot of traffic that kind of backs up in that lane waiting to turn left, and that's part of the issue is because they can't see the sure. curb lane, so they're waiting. Well, maybe if you get a summer and intern, you could have them spend a yeah. little time out there <laughs> yeah. monitoring, do their own little traffic <laughs> survey and see how, you know, and it, it could just be a certain, maybe it's only in the morning. It's right. not at all in the afternoon. Yep. Uh -huh. It's something we can look at and see, and then I'll talk to the county highway commissioner sure. and see what his thoughts are. And then, uh, like uh, Lieutenant Harris said, the... Uh, I think that other issue is an issue of the street painting, which mm -hmm. we, were, we were hoping to get out this week, but it generally needs to be about 60 degrees, and it looks like we're not going to be able to do that for another couple yeah. weeks. So. And that's the same issue with Oregon Street <laughs> with adjusting the we, – we haven't been able to, other than signage, do the right. parking adjustments on Oregon yep. Street. And that's the same thing with uh, moving the bike lanes over on West Haven as well. Um, we're just waiting for the weather to cooperate. Okay. Yeah, I noticed on that area, like uh, a lot of the area – there's not much space between driveways, so you wouldn't be adding that much parking anyway. Yeah, that's probably true. I got another question. I see uh, they had something online about the Sawyer Oshkosh Ave intersection, but I didn't get to read the article. Is there any update on that? Um, I think that's, I'm not sure why they put that in there, other than I think it's because the city has bought and then demoed some of those buildings across from the intersection with the preparation that eventually um, we would do something there. When they did, we had um, KL Engineering did a uh, traffic impact study for the new Oshkosh Avenue or the Oshkosh Corp headquarters. Um, and when they did that, we had them look at the whole corridor from the river to basically just a little bit west of the highway. Um, and one of the things we asked them to look at was that intersection. So they came up with some different alternatives and recommendations. They looked at uh, the roundabout option, which isn't going to work there because of the lift bridge. So what the recommendation is, and there was two variations of it, but it's basically going to be a regular four-way um, signaled intersection. However, the issue is just the cost right now because it's going to be pretty expensive. Um, so the plan is to eventually make that a more traditional intersection. And I believe what the planning department is planning is there's a TIF district created for Oshkosh Avenue, so when the TIF has enough money in it to support something like that, then they can actually go and do the design and then work on the um, implementation. And I know council was also interested in possibly a boulevard on that part of Oshkosh Avenue, which again makes some sense, but it's really expensive. So it's just a matter of getting the funding to, to pay for some of those things. But um, it's something that's in the works. That intersection, interestingly enough, for the for the weird layout there, doesn't really have a high crash history. It actually functions pretty well, but it is a very strange well, it, intersection. It, it does function pretty well, but there's a lot of curb hops mm -hmm. as you go uh, westbound on uh, on 21 because of the to your point that right. that wiggle mm -hmm. as you go past. Uh, you don't know of all the points of impact because Eaton's. of the concrete barriers. And right, that's true. Right. And then there's it's kind the, of a hassle because if you're trailing a boat to go to the Rainbow Park, if you're coming from the west, you know, it's hard to get there. Yeah, 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can't turn left there. No. Yeah, you got right now you can. I know part of the Rainbow Park Master Plan does have different routes into the boat landing areas, and they're going to be expanding the boat landing to the west also. So, and, and then the else in conjunction with that, I know they mentioned in the Article 2, but um, with the, the Oscars Corp headquarters, the plan is for the Wild Wash Trail to be extended along the river to Rainbow Park, um, which makes a lot of sense, but then kind of when you get to Rainbow Park, it's not really, if you're on a bike or pedestrian, it's not really easy to navigate how to get over, you know, the Oshkosh Avenue Bridge. So hopefully we incorporate some type of improvements there as well to, to connect e either to the bike lanes on Sawyer or, you know, to continue on the river walk on either side. Um, so I think that'll be pretty neat when some funding becomes available that we can do something like that. Anyone else with anything at this point? Agenda items for next meeting. I'm assuming we're going to follow through and get some data together. Yeah, yeah. We'll regarding definitely. Mr. Highmark's request. Last call. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>